Hello and welcome to SaaS Bootcamp. This is week three, video one, the week where we get into some really fun stuff with SaaS. Now, if you've been hanging around with us and learning everything in the past two weeks, the stuff that you've been exposed to are things that you would have learned as part of any introductory statistical course. Right? It's pretty typical stuff. Starting this week, that's going to change because this bootcamp is specifically tailored for researchers in health services research and health, out, health economics and outcomes research. So starting this week, we are actually going to introduce a little more advanced SAS functions and we are going to get to play through our exercises and our homeworks with uh, mock data sets that closely approach administrative claims data from Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, these are data sets that you would commonly be working on if you were a graduate student or if you were associated with the University of Mississippi's Pharmacy Administration Department where I work. I will give some mock data sets that are similar to that and show you guys some SAS functions that let you work on these data sets. So without any, without any more delay, let me get started and share with you all the agenda for this week. Okay. So for this week's agenda, we are going to cover three simple topics. We are going to talk about loops. Then we're going to talk about reading across rows within SAS. And we'll do that using three different operations. We'll talk about the lag function, the retain statement and first dot variable and the last dot variable options and we'll wrap up this week with the transpose procedure. So let me go ahead and get started without any delay. All right, um, I am jumping straight into SAS Studio here. And for this video, we are going to talk about loops, but we only cover part of loops in this video. I will do a second video where I go into a little more detail about loops. Uh, but now you can see I've got SAS Studio pulled up on my screen. Um, and you will see that I've got my lib names written, both for my class statement and for my lib. I'm going to go ahead and run these before I start anything else. All right, both have been assigned. I'm going to switch over to my libraries here. Make sure it's right there. All right. Okay. So the first thing we want to do with the lib name statement is, uh, so first thing we want to do with loops today is talk about a little nuance in the if then statement that we did not cover last week. So one of the things we talked about last week was an if then statement where we had an if condition and a then followed by a statement, but we did not cover about what you would do if you had more than one statement based upon one condition, right? What if you have 20, 30 statements that are based on one condition? You can write the condition 20 times in 20 if then statements, but there are better ways to do that. So let's talk about that. Uh, for this example, we are going to use the Poke expanded data set that's right here. We've covered, we've looked at this data set in the previous week, so I'm not going to spend time going over all the columns in this data set right now. Um, let me say, let me call it um, OK underscore table. That's the name of the new data set I'm creating. And I'm working off of the OK underscore expanded data set. Right. Um, let, let me start with a simple example. Let's say we want to identify legendary Pokemons, right? Where legendary equals true, that's a legendary Pokemon. Now we are using the lowercase operator so that uh, in case the uppercase and lowercase of the word true in the data set is, is um, unexpected, we can account for all of that. And here is my condition. And then usually after the then, I would write a statement of what I want SAS to do. But what if I had multiple things I want SAS to do? Then I would just write a do statement followed by an end statement, both with a semicolon in between. And in between my do and end, I can write as many statements as I want. And SAS will execute all of these statements every time this condition is true, right? So instead of just having one statement, we can now have multiple statements. When using this system of the if then statement, be careful with your semicolon paste placements because as you're learning, that's one place you will make mistakes. There is a semicolon after do, there is a semicolon after end, but there is no semicolon after then. After then, if you type do followed by semicolon, you immediately get into this syntax where you can type multiple statements or as many statements as you want. So let me make up some statements here for the sake of an example and show you how this works. Let's say I want to say that every time there's a legendary Pokemon, we assign special points to it and the special points are 100. And then we are going to give it priority, right? And we're going to say uh, priority is first. And I'm, I'm just making up some uh, example statements here. I'm also going to create another variable where I set my favorite Pokemon to be equal to one. And all three of these statements will now be executed 
every time this condition locus legendary equals true is met right um, in an if then with a do end statements you can still use an else option just like you could have done in an if then else statement so i could have said if else um, my favorite pokemon equals 0 and what this else statement does is whenever this is false it just executes that one statement now in my else category if i have more than one statement i can still do else and then follow it up with a do and an end but for now i'm not going to show that this is just the basic example of how to implement the if then else statement with multiple statements so let me go ahead and run this show you guys what this looks like check my log which looks good everything's in blue then move to output and you'll see here and then I now have three different variables that were all created based off of my uh, condition. My condition was the whether legendary equals true or false. And all these variables are only created where legendary was true. So let me go find an example for us to look at. It looks like we didn't have any legendary Pokemon in this data set, which really defeats the purpose of what I'm doing. Uh, let me pick a different example so we can quickly look at this. There you go. I'm just going to set that based on uh, based on HP instead of legendary. Double check my log. Looks okay. Okay. So wherever HP is greater than fifty, call row number two, three, four but not the first row. There you go. So special points is set to 100. Okay, priority is set to first and my favorite Pokemon is set to one. So it worked just like an if then statement, just a shortcut and a faster way to do it. And you will also observe here that because we wrote an else statement, which had my favorite Pokemon, my favorite Pokemon was equal to zero when that condition wasn't met. But our else statement did not say anything about the special points variable or the Poke underscore priority variable. So those are just missing. And if you observe even more keenly, you'll see that a missing value for a numeric variable is a period, but a missing value for a character variable is just, it's just empty. There's nothing in there, right? We've already seen all of this, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. So what we did right here with the do end option based on an if then statement is basically execute a bunch of statements based on one condition. This do end syntax though can be leveraged to build, um, to build a little more complex things like loops. So let's talk about how we can do that. Uh, let me type out this example. So let's say if okay is type underscore one equals fiber or just type underscore two equals fire. Then, right? So I'm doing the same thing as I did just now, but instead of writing a do end statement, I'm going to write something a little more complex. Okay. So what I'm doing here is instead of my do end statement like above, I've actually added a little bit of word, a few a few things after my do word. And what this is saying here is that everything that is written in between the do and the end statement has to be executed 166 times based on a counter variable i. Right? So this counter, this variable i is a new variable that I'm creating in this statement right here. This did not exist in the data set before and we had not previously set the value of i to anything else. We are defining it right here. And this do end loop will now create this variable i, set it to one, and then run all of the statements in between do and end and then come back, increment the value of i to two, and then run all the statements again. And then increment the value of i to three, run all the statements again. Increment the value of i to four, run all the statements again. And what I want to do in between, I, I can do anything I want. Uh, let me give an example. Let's say I want to write if i equals id, which is the id of the Pokemon, then gen one fire Pokemon equals one. And what I'm trying to say here is that um, 
all fire Pokemon within generation one, which is my favorite generation. I just want to identify a flag variable. That flag variable, I'm calling it gen one fire. I'm setting it to one, wherever the Pokemon is a fire type variable within gen one. How do I know it is gen one? I haven't actually written code to check it as generation one. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm saying that when you loop I from one to 166, check if ID equals to that number. If ID is anywhere between one to 166, what that means is that that ID is less than 166, which means it's a gen one Pokemon, right? So this do and loop, what it is doing is it is holding down SAS's program data vector to a certain row. Because when SAS starts executing a certain program, it goes first row, second row, third row, fourth row, and so on and so forth. Well, the do and loop basically holds the program data vector in place on the first row and says, let me execute this 166 times. Once for i equals one, and then i equals two, i equals three, all the way to i equals 165, all the way to i equals 166. And then I will let you move on to the second row. So in that first row, we have set in the value of i anywhere from one to 166 incrementally, right? And then for each value of i, we are going to check if i is equal to id or not. So let's say id of a certain Pokemon is 35, right? When, when we start doing this loop, the id 35 is not equal to the value of i, which is one because we just started the loop. But on the second iteration of the loop, i equals two, still not equal to 35. But on the 35th iteration of that loop, i equals 35, and it becomes equal to my ID variable, which tells me, hey, this is a gen one Pokemon. Then it goes ahead and sets that gen one fire, my flag variable to be equal to one. Right. So let me see if this works before we go any further. Log looks good. Output data. There it is. Gen one fire equals one for fire type Pokemon. Let's see if this was a fire type Pokemon right here. Um, I'm gonna just hold on to this row. There it is, it's a fire type Pokemon. All of these are fire type Pokemon. These are not fire type Pokemon. Now the other thing you will observe in this data set is this variable called I that we created as part of that do and loop, right? as part of that do loop. Now this variable equals 167 because that's where the loop stop executing. The loop goes from I equals one to 166 for every single row. And at the last row when everything is over, it stops at i equals 167. And that's actually true for every row as well. So you will see that i equals 167 for every single one of these rows. But this is actually missing for some other rows because remember, we only executed the loop when the type of the Pokemon was fire, which was true right here in this, in this row, but not for the previous rows, right? So i is missing for these rows, but for these rows where the Pokemon is fire type, i equals 167, and you can see gen one fire equals one. Same thing is happening here. Uh, here the ID variable is um, 43 and 44, which means on the 43rd iteration of the do loop, it found that the variable i was equal to ID, and it managed to set this flag variable. It managed to set this flag variable to one, right? I hope that makes sense. Now, while this was an example, I really did not, if this was my goal to set to identify gen one fire type Pokemon, I really did not have to go this far. Right? I could have just written an if then statement where I said, if ID less than 166, and, I, and that would have been enough. I didn't need to write a do statement. I didn't need to write a do loop of all things, right? Or create a counter variable which increments, that was unnecessary, but I'm just trying to demonstrate how I can do this. And then in the next loop video, we'll go ahead and look at some uh, very interesting things you can do using loops, using do loops in particular.